Lord of the Oasis. Chapter 11, Desert Bandit Lair The ten Swadian peasants had their work cut out for them. One went to the council hall to fetch the wooden ladder. Another peasant steadily climbed up to the roof to fetch the baskets, as well as shears for cutting the clusters of dates hanging on the branches of the trees, to make plucking and drying the dates easier. The dates were ripe and fresh, so they required careful handling. There was no doubt that the peasants knew that well. They were all experienced farmhands who had long been working in the fields. None of this posed much of a problem for them as long as they were careful and attentive. Kant felt at ease handing off these duties to the peasants. At present, he had other matters that required his attention. Among the said matters, there was the desert bandit lair. That quest reward had come the previous evening. It was acquired when Kant and the Dukedom of Leo Knights put their lives on the line to annihilate the Jack Allens who had taken over the Oasis lookout. According to the system's judgment, quests that came with the risk of having entire forces wiped out came with high-level rewards. This is rather curious. Kant's mind was immediately connected to the system. When the data card of that item appeared on his retina, he was able to see that it was a house constructed using sand and stone. Horses were tied at the door. Soldiers carrying spears and wearing leather armor walked by. There was no doubt that they were units per the name of the reward Desert Bandits. However, Kant was still somewhat stunned. Desert Bandits? He was unable to help but frown as if he had recalled something. In the system from his past life, there were monster units in the territories of the Saran Sultanate that went by that name. They appeared in groups in the Sea of Sand, plundering trade caravans and villagers. As such, they were considered robbers who were out to do no good. These units were so notorious that sensible players in the early stages of the game learned to steer away from the deserts that were known to be filled with desert bandits. Are they really who I think they are? Kant gulped. His eyes were filled with joy. If they were the criminals who roamed the desert like a storm, as recorded in the system, they would be an absolute boon to the present oasis lookout. To him, they were considered more precious than the twenty date palm trees that provided extra food to the village. His mind was filled with excitement, yet his expression remained calm, as usual. His life as a young noble enabled him to learn how to conceal his true emotions with calmness. He walked briskly to the southern side of the oasis lookout. He circled the pond of spring water, which was where the council hall was located. He decided to make that area the residential and crafts section of Drondheim from then on out. That was the region he had thoughtfully divided. If different trades were to grow and prosper in the future, there could be a commercial area developed there. The northern side, which was where the six desert poplar trees and twenty date palm trees were found, would serve purely as an agricultural area. Although the Oasis Lookout did not currently have half a hectare of farmable lands, he still had to take the development of his fief from then on out into consideration. If his place were to be one incapable of producing food, it would be tantamount to being choked by others. There was no way Kant could give up agriculture altogether, even though the production of crops might be minimal. He even had thoughts of sending people to the dukedom of Leo on the other side of the Seenway arranged to dig up huge amounts of soil. Such a crude, foolish-looking method would have allowed him to enhance the number of farmable lands at the Oasis Lookout. The journey from the Oasis Lookout to the Seenway Range took the knights about three days to cover. It would take carriages and infantry units seven days at most. The distance, which required a week to cover, was still what Kant, who was desperate to have the Oasis developed, considered to be with intolerable limits. My lord! The ten Swadian militia members were on standby near the council hall. They lowered their heads and greeted him respectfully to show respect for their lord. Yet. Kant nodded. He did not arrange for them to do anything else. He simply replied, stay sharp. The threat of the Jack Allens was still lurking out there somewhere. These ten militia members were not the only ones who were on standby. The twenty Swadian recruits were patrolling the dunes nearby. They could quickly retreat and report to the council if they found something, while would allow them time to prepare to deal with enemy threats with the fifty Swadian peasants. 
While there were only 80 of them, given how all of them would defend their homes courageously, not even a force of 200 Jack Allens would be able to defeat them if they were to form tight formations with their pole arms outstretched. Furthermore, Kant was about to add a new troop class to his roster. It was the Desert Bandits. He went to the side of the council hall and began to seriously look at the surrounding terrain. Confirming the construction of the Desert Bandit lair would add a second building to the Oasis Lookout. At the same time, the building was crucial for allowing Kant to gain another class of combatants. System, construct the building at the eastern side of the council hall. Kant made his final decision. A large number of data streams appeared on his retina as he gave the order. A simple building, which was constructed with stone and wooden materials, was quickly erected right beside the council hall. The process took about two seconds. The building, which previously only existed in data card form, was instantly brought into the world. A desert bandit lair was given by the system. Kant eyed the place, finding it to be a simple single-story house that was constructed using stone and wooden materials as the foundation. The lair seemed to have an area of 1,080 square feet and was about 9 feet high, which was noticeably lower than the 19-foot-tall council hall next to it. However, there was a stable made of wood next to the house, which was about 215 square feet. Sniff. Light snorting sounds were heard, which startled Kant. Is someone in there? Kant eyed the place. He knew that his ears were not playing tricks on him. Those were obvious snorting sounds, which sounded just like those commonly heard from horses. That meant there were horses in the stable. It also meant that there were people in the building. The narrow wooden door was pushed open from the inside. Five stout men wearing linen robes walked outside. They were holding spears. Their faces, which had a dark complexion from prolonged exposure to the sun, looked fierce and unyielding, yet they appeared incredibly respectful. We bow to you, Lord, as your humble servants, the five greeted him respectfully. Right, very well. Kant nodded slightly. There was a smile on his smile. The joy in his eyes was unmistakable. It was just as he guessed. These five stout men were desert bandits of the Saran Sultanate who roamed in groups and took on the desert like a sandstorm. Underneath their simple, crude linen robes was fine leather armor. While they all held six-foot-long spears, they still carried round shields and flanged maces for close-quarter combat right behind their backs. Four javelins were arranged neatly on the sacks on their backs as well. Along with the desert horses in the stables, the equipment became the combination of tools that made them fearsome entities in the desert. The desert bandits were equally as good at initiating cavalry charges with their horses or surrounding their enemies and throwing their heavy, lethal javelins. In close quarters combat, their round shields effectively blocked enemy attacks. Their flanged maces, which were blunt trauma weapons that excelled in armor penetration, served as a lethal threat to even the most well-armed enemies. Splendid, splendid indeed. The smile on Kant's face was unmistakable. He asked, are there only five of you in the lair? Indeed, my lord. The five desert bandits nodded. One of them quickly said, if you are willing to pay 30 dinars per member, there will be one desert bandit who will willingly join your ranks every week. From then on out, weekly maintenance for each member will be 12 dinars per week. Seems nice. Kant nodded. While the 30 dinars to recruit seemed steep, and 12 dinars per week for maintenance seemed hefty, Kant saw all of that to be acceptable. The value of these ferocious bandits was sun to be laid bare for all to see. They were excellent units among second-level troop classes. For instance, the second-level troop class that Kant currently possessed, the 10 Swadian militia, paled in comparison to the desert bandits. It could be said that with sound tactics employed, the five desert bandits could easily take out all of the Swadian militia without losing a single member, even if all of those Swadian militia were armed with heavy spears. Their ferocious skills had been developed and honed by the harsh, unforgiving desert. Kant asked, can I begin recruitment right now? The desert bandits did not answer. 
they became quiet after giving their previous explanation. The system immediately answered him in their stead. You may begin recruitment. A prompt from the system was heard in his ear. Do you want to recruit now? Recruit. Kant nodded. Recruitment, Desert Bandit X1. 30 dinars spent. A dialog box popped up. The wooden door of the lair, which was constructed using stone and wooden materials, opened again. Another desert bandit in near-identical attire appeared. He briskly walked and stood with the other five, looking fierce and unyielding. While he looked respectfully at Kant's face, his eyes remained fixed on other areas, which was typical of a bandit. It was as if he was out to rob the place at any given moment. This place is now a lot safer with six desert bandits around. As he looked at them, Kant felt pleased with the situation. The six desert bandits were not regular infantry units. They were cavalry units. Armed with spears, they could easily be used as fierce shock troops. They were capable of tearing through enemy formations and easily crushing enemy forces. Dealing with primitive Jack Allens would be considered a piece of cake to them. My lord, my lord. Just as Kant was still feeling pleased with himself, a desperate call could be heard from behind. Kant turned around and saw a Swadian peasant. He was carrying a tattered urn in his hand and walking quickly toward his lord. He shouted, We seem to have found something. Chapter 12, Coarse Salt in the Urn The urn was the color of earth and about the size of a grown man's head. It seemed to have been used for a very long time, which was evident by the severe scuff marks on the edges. Only bits and pieces of the original image were left on the urn, making it hard to distinguish what it was. My lord, I think you'd need to look at this. The Swadian peasant holding the old, tattered urn looked serious. Right, hold on. Kant frowned at the peasant holding the urn. Upon seeing the earth-colored tattered urn, his frown deepened as he said, if you're talking about this thing here, it's just an old urn that should be disposed of. I don't think you need to bring it here. This world had no technology for making porcelain, but it did have the technology for making high-grade earthenware. Fine, high-grade earthenware was actually quite expensive. It was especially so in the eyes of Kant, who was from a noble family. That old, tattered urn had no value to anyone but the poorest of paupers. Even if something like that were left on the streets, few people would pick it up and consider it a treasure. Most people would leave it for the street cleaners to find and dispose of. The dukedom of Leo produced huge amounts of clay. As such, high-grade and low-grade earthenware were practically everywhere, making the urn nearly worthless. No, it's not the urn itself. The Swadian peasant shook his head. What is it? Kant looked on with a curious expression. This. The peasant approached Kant. He gently and carefully held the tattered urn up for him to see. The urn seemed to have something contained within it. As he looked, white bits flickered in the light of the sun. Kant was slightly stunned. The sight seemed quite familiar. He looked in the urn and found that those white, scattered bits were some kind of white powdery substance. The identification of the substance instantly popped into his mind. Salt. His eyes slightly widened. The peasant nodded affirmatively and said, Indeed, my lord. It is salt. Hints of joy could be seen in Kant's eyes. In such a backward world, both salt and sugar were considered rare seasonings and condiments. Even as the youngest son of the duke and a baron of the dukedom of Leo, he had brought less than two baskets full of those seasonings when he came to his fief. Ten pounds of salt. Ten pounds of sugar and five pounds of black pepper were all the seasonings he acquired when he was conferred the title of baron. Where did you get this urn of salt? he asked. Kant unconsciously gulped. He looked at the peasant, who appeared excited. We found it in one of the jackalands tents. There was a tent bigger than the others, and we found the urn when we were cleaning up the place, the peasant said as he pointed to a patch of grass not far away. Jack Allen's. Kant licked his lips as his brows furrowed in contemplation. He glanced at the tent, which had been cobbled together with beast pelts and linen cloth, 
that remained unpacked. It looked much larger than a usual Jack Allen tent. He quickly came to understand something quite important. This was likely the tent that belonged to the leader of the Jack Allens. Although they were considered a primitive race, they still had castes. The leader was often the one who hoarded most of the tribe's wealth. However, what piqued Kant's interest even more was how salt was discovered in a Jack Allen tribe. It was worth noting that even lesser lords in the comparatively wealthy dukedom of Leo would not have so much salt in their households. It's probably from a salt mine in the desert. A desert bandit spoke in a confident tone. It was apparent he knew of such salt being found in the desert. It was especially apparent when the eyes of everyone present scanned the white powdery salt in the urn, which had bits of grey in it. It confirmed what the bandit had said. Furthermore, it's an open-air salt mine. These coarse salts were collected from alkali soils. Coarse salts from alkali soils. Kant twisted his head a bit. His brow lifted. The desert bandit nodded and said, Indeed. It's very close to the salt produced by the salt mines in the Saran Sultanate. Another desert bandit added to the explanation. These are probably coarse salts that were just simply collected and cleaned. There are still bits of sands in them, so the texture is awful. Sarand craftsmen filter the coarse salts for a bit before boiling them and refining them into finer table salts. So, that's how it's done. Kant slightly nodded. Thoughts welled up in Kant's mind as he kept looking at the coarse salt in the urn. If that is true, we can be sure that there is alkali soil found in the deeper reaches of Naran Desert. Kant tried his best to maintain a calm expression, yet his excitement was heard leaking out through the tone of his voice. The desert bandits nodded affirmatively. Going by common logic, that is indeed how it should be. Joy instantly filled Kant's face. Even if he were to do his best to suppress his emotions, the burst of joy deep down still made him struggle to control himself. This is very good news. He gulped and tightly clenched his fists. Salt might have been of little value in modernized earth, but if one were to look into human history, salty seasonings had once been a symbol of luxury and high status, be it in the east or west. It was something that had once been exclusive to rich people. It worked the same in this mysterious dimension of swords and magic that resembled the Middle Ages. Salt was an expensive seasoning. At the same time, it was one of the common materials mages employed when casting magic. As such, having access to a precious supply meant having access to vast wealth. It was quite a surprise that somewhere deep in the barren Naran desert, there was actually alkali soil full of salt. The newly discovered fact excited Kant tremendously. This is an opportunity. As he gulped, happiness was seen in his eyes. However, he was still extremely cautious about it. As a transported, he understood what he would gain by having access to a place that produced salt. Wealth. Opportunity. Schemes. Kant licked his lips as he looked around. His mind slowly calmed. There was the only village in the Oasis lookout and Drondheim was filled with his men and no outsiders. As such, from the looks of things at the moment, it was a secret known only to him. Ding the oasis was finally clean through painstaking hard work. Side quest, clean up the oasis is complete. Reward acquired, Flower X20. Comment, that could be easily accomplished with only simple labor, right? Just as Kant was still enjoying his joyful mood, a prompt came from the system. A dialog box appeared on his retina, confirming the completion of the side quest he was assigned in the morning. At the same time, twenty bags of flour were prepared in some mystical space of the system, which Kant would be able to easily materialize at any given moment. Good news does come in pairs. Kant smiled. He looked at the urn of salt below his leg, which had been a pleasant surprise. As long as Drondheim was developed, Kant had enough to defend and feed himself. The salt would serve as an auxiliary force, propelling his further success. He could open a trade route to the dukedom and gain more wealth. Salt was something that could almost serve as currency. He saw a flicker on his retina. The system had assigned him another side quest. 
Ding side quest assigned. Side quest, the origins of salt. Reward, standard Swadian house x5. Introduction, where did the salt come from? That is a question worthy of careful search in the deeper reaches of the desert. You might find different resources there, just like those precious salt. Kant shook his head and smiled as he looked at the dialogue box on his retina. Even without the quest assigned by the system, he still would have assigned someone to thoroughly look into the place where the salt came from. An alkali soil at? That's mine. Kant's face was filled with determination. If such precious resources were to be taken over by the primitive Jack Allens, it would be a terrible waste. Kant needed to take the salt mine resources for himself. He did not bother with any pretentious compassion or excuses. He made it clear right there and then that he wanted to take such resources for himself, one way or another, to fuel the development of his fief. He was completely willing to clash with another Jack Allen tribe if that was what was required. Swadians do not fear. Kant's eyes were filled with pride and might. The Kingdom of Swadia was known for its exceptional feats at ground warfare in the continent of Karadia. In such a world, eliminating the Jack Allens, who were still in a primitive stage, was an easy feat. Furthermore, with access to the system, Kant could sustain his warring efforts for years. Even if he were to trade the lives of ten Swadian peasants for a single unit advancing to become a Swadian knight, it would be worthwhile. We shall make plans for this. However, he quickly calmed himself and returned to his usual self. It was imperative to search for the salt mine, but he needed to be cautious while venturing deep into the Naran desert. It was absurd to charge into the Sea of Sands without proper preparations just because it was a quest from the system. He would be little more than a fool if he were to do so. Then again, he smiled in an even more brimming manner as he looked at the six desert bandits by his side. Luckily, I have desert experts by my side. Chapter 13 Serendon Wisdom The desert bandits served as Kant's backing. He was very confident about being able to finish that side quest assigned by the system. It was mostly because the desert bandits were from the desert nation of Saren Sultanate, so they were more than familiar with the brutal environment of a desert. Their skills were honed in the vast sea of sand, so they could all be considered desert survival experts. The six desert bandits had the potential to help get into the deeper reaches of the Naran desert. As for that alkali soil, which was rich in natural salt, Kant had long made up his mind about it. He would take it by all means. Kant hailed from the dukedom of Leo and was the youngest son of Duke Cameron, who was the top leader of the entire nation. Although Kant was not a favorite due to his mother dying young, all the mandatory aristocratic education he received from his youth enabled him to be quite knowledgeable. He was also a transported. Having lived two lives, there was no doubt that his learning ability was extremely formidable. He had indeed learned a great deal. It was just like how things were at the moment. Kant was able to tell how much of a commotion he would cause back in the dukedom, which was a nation filled with flatlands and hills, just from the fact that he had acquired intelligence regarding table salt resources. That was because the dukedom of Leo was not a salt-producing nation. Furthermore, none of all the other dukedoms, which were human territories, neighboring the dukedom of Leo, were salt-producing nations either. If they wanted to have saltiness in their food, they could only satisfy such needs by importing salt. According to the books Kant read in the Tower of Mages back in the castle, merchants needed to venture into faraway mountains, which were territories that belonged to non-human races. Those were territories belonging to dwarfs, who were versed in the art of tunneling and smithing. Table salt was bought from those stout, earthy dwarfs, who were usually around 4 feet 5 inches tall before ferrying them back thousands of miles to be sold in the human nations. The dwarfs owned a salt mine 984 feet underground. Mining operations were conducted all day long, satisfying the alt needs of many nations. They were the greatest exporter of salt in the entire continent. As such, the price of salt in human nations had always been high. Also, salt was not the usual type of seasoning available to commoners. 
one pound of high-grade fine salt was of equal value to a strong, healthy horse. That was the testament to just how pricey such a seasoning could be. During the years that saw trade routes hindered by war or spice shortages, spices of even higher value, such as top-grade black pepper, were almost worth their weight in gold. They were also luxuries that greater nobles held in high regard and greatly valued. Kant had ample experiences regarding such facts. He had been in that world for sixteen years and attended all manners of feasts and banquets, regardless of size. However, he had never been able to feast on foods that were heavily seasoned with many different spices, not even once. While this world had swords and magic, as well as numerous mystical items and fantastical races, it was still one that fundamentally resembled Earth during the European Middle Ages. It vastly lacked material supplies, and things were simple and backward. It was a feudal age that many found to be exasperating. Huff. Kant took a deep breath. He quelled all that excitement deep down, returning to his usual calm self. He still had to deal with reality. Without ample strength, there was no way he could initiate contact with the dukedom of Leo personally. That place was filled with hyenas. It was where eternally insatiable monsters thrived. The concept of vast wealth eventually getting one into major trouble was something that had been abhorrently apparent back in his past life on Earth. If the image of the Naran desert being a destitute, barren place was broken, and the fact that there was a salt mine that represented massive profit presented before the eyes of the nobles of the dukedom of Leo, there might just be some bandits from somewhere out to make that baron of the oasis lookout disappear from the world forever. Kant never held the safety and security of that world in high regard. It was a world in which might made right. If a child were to carry gold pieces while getting near thugs, one could easily imagine what awaited that child. I still need to become powerful myself. Kant shook his head somewhat, but he still wore a joyful smile. He was able to feel that joy because he was confident. He was born with the essence of the kingdom of Swadia, which was inherent within the system. It was a cheat that belonged only to Kant. Go back and get busy. Kant gave orders to the Swadian peasant who was waiting by his side. Yes, my lord. The peasant nodded respectfully. As the peasant was about to leave, he seemed to have recalled something. While still cradling that tattered urn, he asked, My lord, what should I do about the coarse salt in the urn? That salt was raw and coarse and had yet to be filtered. Not only was there sand mixed in it, but there were also a number of potentially harmful substances. The coarse salt had been scraped directly from the alkali soil. The Jack Allens had no problem eating it like that. For human digestive systems, which were more delicate, eating things like that was a challenge. After eating this kind of coarse salt, a human would have quickly displayed signs of food poisoning, such as vomiting and diarrhea. In the worst case scenario, it had the potential to be life threatening. Well, Kant was rather baffled. He turned his eyes toward the six desert bandits. My lord, we know how to cook the salt to run coarse salt into table salt. The six desert bandits were living up to their expectations. They nodded affirmatively and said, doing so is actually quite simple. Very well. Kant nodded with satisfaction. The desert where the Saran Sultanate was located also had alkali soils. Sarandans, who lived in the desert, knew how to make the inedible raw coarse salt into edible seasoning through some ancient methods passed down through the generations. A furnace, two large pots, and a huge amount of charcoal were all that was required to refine salt. All of that was easily found inside the council hall. Kent looked at the desert bandits with curious eyes. He paid close attention to how they turned harmful raw coarse salt into edible table salt. So. Do you people filter the salt using charcoal? Kant had a general concept of how the process worked. All the mandatory education he received in his past life did not go to waste. The furnace was lit. The water in the huge pot quickly came to a boil. The desert bandits poured all the coarse salt from the old, tattered urn into the pot. As the steam rose, the white coarse salt began to dissolve in the boiling water. However, 
that huge pot of clear spring water seemed to have grey impurities seen in it. There were so many that bits of granules could almost be seen in all that boiling water with the naked eye. It was all dirt. Keep the fire low. We shall lower the heat afterward, a desert bandit said. Another desert bandit, who was waiting at the side, immediately turned the fire in the furnace to low. The boiling salt water gradually settled. A layer of fine sand could be seen at the bottom of the pot. While the salt was water-soluble, any other solids fell to the bottom. This is interesting. Kant nodded. This was a piece of useful knowledge that could be applicable to daily life. After a while, the salt water became clear while the sediment at the bottom was packed together. One would have found it hard to imagine just how dirty the seemingly clean, white coarse salt had actually just been. Get ready. The desert bandit in charge of the operation had spoken. Another desert bandit quickly fetched a second big pot, which was packed with charcoal on the inside. It served as the key to filtering out the impurities. That desert bandit took a large wooden spatula and began to dump salt water into the pot filled with charcoal. His moves were fast and adept. There was only a thin layer of salt water and a layer of dirt left at the bottom of the pot. We're basically done. The desert bandit told the others, dump the garbage away and scrub the pot clean. He hastily wiped the sweat off of his face and turned around to face Kant with a smile. He said, My lord, we shall let it sit for an hour before repeating the process with a new pot and fresh charcoal four times. After we're done with the filtering, we will boil the water until it dries up. We will then be able to sift good, edible fine salt from the finished product. Very well. Kant nodded. He looked at the steaming iron pot with salt water being mixed within the charcoal. These natural filters easily filtered out most of the impurities. The only steps left were to repeat the process several times, leaving only pure salt water behind. After that, they would have to continue to heat the iron pot with fire and sift the salt from the end product. Eventually, the process resulted in edible table salt. My lord! The desert bandit said with full surety, this will become high-grade white salt. Splendid! Splendid indeed! Kant nodded as he wore a brimming smile on his face. This was definitely something to be happy about. He fully understood what white salt really meant. He knew the value of such things better than most. The eventual fine, Snow White Salt was capable of fetching very high prices back in the Dukedom of Leo, especially since such an item was only available to great nobles and very wealthy merchants. It was possible that every pound could be sold for at least fifty great silvers. It was a luxury that only nobles had access to. This salt was definitely different from the coarser salt, which was obtained through wells, usually eaten by wealthier commoners and lesser lords. This fine, high-grade salt was not only expensive, but it also came with a symbol of status. I really can't wait. Kant was already smiling from ear to ear. Within just half a day, inedible coarse salt from alkali soil was turned into fine white salt that could fetch exorbitant prices. As long as Kant was able to seize that natural salt mine in the form of alkali soil, he could easily earn massive profits from the monopoly. As such, he was very eager to see the finished product. While he was currently incapable of organizing trade caravans in broad daylight and selling the salt in huge batches in the dukedom, he could still sell small amounts of the fine, white salt on the black market. He believed that many would likely kill to get their hands on the salt. This salt was much more than just a seasoning. It was an essential material for the mages in the towers to cast spells, as well as a symbol of status flaunted by the nobles. One way or another, Kant would have no problem selling the precious salt. Chapter 14, Scrumptious Dinner Time quickly passed. The sun could be seen in the western dunes, scattering evening light throughout the oasis. The night was about to arrive. The dazzling stars began to subtly appear in the sky. A crescent moon soon brightly shone white light on the desert. This was the oasis lookout of the Naran Desert. It was where Drontheim was located. The peasants, who hailed from the kingdom of Swadia, stayed busy. With tools in hand, 
they carefully ploughed the land on the northern side of the oasis. They cleared out useless weed and made the place look like a field. Waterways were dug, forming effective irrigation channels for the would-be farm. The lands that were being worked on would become Drondheim's agricultural area. While the place was still barren and no crops were currently being planted, it was still a good idea to work the dirt beforehand. Most importantly, the irrigation channels were dug long enough to reach the date palm trees. The twenty grown date palm trees served as the only crop-producing plants Drondheim had at the moment. While they were trees and only able to produce dates, said crops were able to fill the bellies of the people, which slightly eased their food shortage predicament. At the same time, those date palm trees served as a solid line of defense against the desert's encroachment. As long as the roots of the trees remained strong and sturdy, capable of reaching huge areas, the sand underneath would remain in place. By doing so, the oasis was able to maintain its shape, avoiding getting increasingly smaller from the encroachment of the desert. Furthermore, as the fallen leaves piled up, a new layer of soil would begin to form. When coupled with ample water, it set into motion the gradual expansion of the oasis. Then again, the beneficial cycles that led to the growth of the oasis would take hundreds of years to occur naturally. Get dinner ready. We might just be making larger portions tonight. Kant looked at the exhausted peasants. He wore a smile on his lips as he said, put more dried meat into the meals. We all need better nourishment after a day of hard work. The three peasants who served as cooks nodded and began to get the kitchen utensils ready. Those three were given their orders by Kant beforehand, so they did not participate in the digging of channels or clean-up of the oasis. They needed to prepare dinner at noon since Lord Kant asked for the dinner to be prepared in bigger, loftier portions. Although they were not all that proficient in cooking, as long as there was meat, the dinner would become an excellent feast regardless. Furthermore, more than 40 baskets full of dates had been collected in the morning. Even if everyone were to only eat bread and dates, drinking only spring water from the oasis, that would have lasted them for 15 days. With the addition of the 20 new bags of flour in the storage room, the total amount of food was expected to last for 30 days. While they still lacked a sustainable food source, they no longer had to immediately worry about food. The kitchen furnaces in the council hall were ignited. In mere moments, the fragrance of food wafted throughout the oasis along with the wind. The peasants, who only had some bread and dates at noon, were famished. All of them gulped as they smelled the enticing fragrance. Their eyes were fixed on the kitchen. The wait before the meal was excruciating for those famished peasants. However, the Swadian recruits on guard duty were having an even harder time as they held their spears. They had not had much to eat at lunchtime. However, for the sake of the village's safety, they needed to make sacrifices. The twenty units were divided into two platoons. They stood guard at the eastern and western dunes, respectively. As dusk came, the dazzling stars and bright moonlight enabled them to barely see what was out there over three hundred feet away. They had been on guard and watching for the Jack Allens. The ten Swadian militia in Drondheim were just as careful and alert. At least for the moment, it was fortunate that things were still safe. However, their luck was not an excuse to let their guards down. No one knew when those ferocious, brutal Jack Allens would retaliate for the earlier slaughter. Dinner is ready. Three peasants brought pots out of the kitchen. There were bread slices toasted to golden perfection, as well as thick, hearty vegetable soup made using dried meat, cabbage, and flour. There was also the freshly plucked dates. We thank our Lord for giving us food. Whispers of gratitude were heard from the mouths of the peasants at dinner. Kant nodded and raised his hand, saying, You've earned it. It was a simple ritual. Kant was their lord and owner of the system, which made him someone equivalent to a king of the Swadians given where they were. As such, it was only a matter of fact that they respected such a figure from the bottom of their hearts. Kant's dinner was prepared as well. His portion had black pepper and sugar, as well as fine, white salt, cooked and filtered by the desert bandits, added. Not bad at all. 
Kant nodded in satisfaction. The dried meat had been roasted and given a dash of crushed black pepper, making it exude a mesmerizing fragrance. When the dried meat was eaten with the clean, white, fine salt on the wooden plate, Kant felt as if he was back at a feast thrown by Cameron, the Duke of the Dukedom of Leo, enjoying tasty roast meat available only to nobles. He gulped them down and narrowed his gaze. He quipped with a smile, this is really good. The dinner had been a very good one. Kant was not the only one who enjoyed the meal. The peasants, who had been working hard throughout the day, shared the same thoughts. Even the soldiers who took turns eating dinner expressed heartfelt gratitude for the food that night. In a barren desert like that, there was no guarantee that every meal could be so hearty. That was even more so given the fact that they were able to enjoy sweet dates and clean water after the meal. Everything truly felt heavenly. The peasants even thought that they would really be blessed if they were able to sleep on beds instead of holes in the sand. It was truly a pity. Drontheim currently only had two buildings the council hall and desert bandit lair. Before they could acquire better residences, new side quests needed to be completed. Also, the location of the salt needed to be discovered before the system provided a reward of five standard kingdom of Swadia styled stone and wood houses. At present, most of them had to sleep in tents and sand holes. Stay sharp in the night. Kant gave a final order before going to bed. The soldiers answered affirmatively, rest assured, my lord. Everyone had experienced a long day, so it was a good idea for them to go to bed early. As for the soldiers, they took turns resting. After all, they were the ones who had taken up guard duty in the night to keep everyone safe. Before long, everyone had gone to bed. When the Swadian peasants returned to their holes and lied down, loud snoring was quickly heard throughout the oasis, which sounded rather irritating. The night was no longer young. Midnight soon arrived. Only the snores of the peasants continued to be heard throughout the oasis lookout. There were five Swadian militia standing guard and staying alert for everyone else. Gosh, the snoring is awful. One of the militia members shook his head exasperatingly and sighed. I can't even sleep even if I want to now. Just bear with it. This is nothing. The other militia member held onto his heavy spear. He spoke in an unfazed manner. You have no idea just how awful your snoring was when I was sleeping by your side. What? For real? That militia member rolled his eyes exasperatedly and asked, How come I know nothing of it? You were fast asleep just like a dead pig, the other militia member jested. The militia member who complained first was just about to retort when he caught sight of something not far away from the dunes. There seemed to be some dark shadows at the dunes, which alerted him. Hey, what's that over there? He did not let his guard down. He instead jabbed at the other militia member with his arm. Hey! That other militia member peered toward that direction as he frowned. The dunes east of the oasis lookout had starlight and moonlight shining over them. The sand seemed like it was being blown in the wind in the dark sky, which looked out of place. That militia member's expression became serious as he said, Something is not right. Yeah, I saw shadows just a moment ago the other militia member added with a gulp. He had a bad feeling and was unable to help but mumble, are those damned Jack Allens really going to sneak up on us in the night? Go and wake the others. The other militia member did not respond to him. Instead, he said in a serious tone, be quick about it. We'll do. That militia member behaved just as seriously as he ran toward the roof. Shadows were lurking on top of the dunes at the end of the two militia members' line of sight. They did not look human under the moonlight. They resembled beasts walking upright. There was no way the militia would not be able to tell that the scattered Jack Allens were sneaking up on them in the dark of night. Chapter 15, The Thick Stench of Blood The news of an incoming enemy attack spread quickly. All those who had been fast asleep in the Oasis lookout were now all wide awake. Their eyes might have still looked somewhat drowsy, but underneath that drowsiness was full readiness to fight. They all hoped for a satisfying victory to prove their valiance. Swadians never feared war. 
The 10 Swadian militia and 20 Swadian recruits all stood ready with their spears as they gathered in the council hall. Nothing seemed unusual in the tents. The 50 Swadian peasants were standing ready for battle with their long scythes. Everyone awaited Kant's orders. Stay quiet. He did not give the order for them to emerge out of their buildings or tents. He wanted them all to keep waiting. He squatted on the council hall's roof, narrowing his eyes as he peered at the dunes far away. He wore a sarcastic smirk as he quipped, maybe those ugly bastards know of only one such tactic, eh? Scattered shadows were seen moving on the dunes. The bright moonlight shone all over the ground, which enabled them to vaguely see the beast-like heads and bodies of their would-be invaders. Those were Jack Allens. My lord, we shall get to our horses. Six desert bandits were squatting right behind Kant. The six of them wore harsh expressions as they eyed the approaching Jack Allens. Be careful, and don't alert anyone. Kant nodded, permitting them to leave. He looked just as focused as everyone else. His eyes had nothing but seriousness in them. Not even he had expected just how tough the battle that night would be. The scale of victory weighing his odds did not seem to be in his favor. There were simply too many Jack Allens showing up at his door. Things don't look good. As he stayed on guard, Kant calmed his breathing and kept his eyes focused on the faraway dunes. While moonlight did not give them visibility like that of sunlight, everyone was still able to see what was over 300 feet away. Kant assessed that there were more than 300 Jack Allens ready to attack them. He was even able to detect that there might be more Jack Allens waiting to strike from behind the dunes. At this point, things were not looking good. The situation had taken a turn for the worse. A militia member behind him seriously asked, My lord, what should we do? We wait. Kant answered in a straightforward, affirmative manner. He estimated that at least 500 Jack Allens were sneaking up on them in the dark of night. The beasts outnumbered them at least five to one. He only had 87 SWAT Ians at his side, and 50 of them were peasants who did not specialize in combat. If he were to win this battle, he could not afford to rely on conventional strategies. If all of his people took formations and fought the invaders head-on, he might have as well asked to be mowed down in a single charge. Kant was not a fool. So, he arranged for his troops to continue hiding. He made it seem as if none of them had discovered anything. If only they were here now. Kant made a causal quip, seeking what bit of joy he could in the severe situation. He still ended sighing in exasperation. The they he referred to meant Rowan's men. The 20 dukedom of Leo knights working with six desert bandits and 80 infantry units would have enabled them to attack with the element of surprise on their side. It would have easily crushed the Jack Allens sneakily coming at them. They were cavalry units, so their formidable mobility would have brought a devastating force to bear in such a situation. Too bad none of them are here. He wiped his face and returned to his serious and alert state of mind. Even without reinforcements, he and the SWAT Ians still had to defend the oasis. That oasis was now called Drondheim, which was the location of their village. Just as Kant was about to raise his hand and give an order, a dialogue box flickered on his retina. A prompt from the system was heard. Ding main quest assigned. Main quest, annihilate the enemy sneaking in the night. Reward, equipment for Swadian militia, hunting crossbows. Introduction, it is late at night and cold winds blow across the sandy dunes. A massive number of enemies are gathering. All of them come with seething hatred. They intend to retake the oasis where their tribe once called home. For you, it will be a battle for survival. It was another quest from the system. Kant was somewhat startled. His pupils instantly contracted as he discovered that it was not the usual side quests that popped up now and again. It was a main quest. That was the second main quest Kant had encountered thus far. The first was to build his village, which was accomplished the previous night. Now, the system had assigned him another main quest just as he was about to deal with the ambush from the Jack Allens in the dark of night. You're forcing my hand. Kant licked his lips. His eyes were filled with exasperation. 
With the assignment being a main quest, it meant that he had to see through to its completion one way or another. A new main quest was only possible if he completed the one he had just been given. Everything in the system was done step by step and interconnected. There was a possibility of failing that main quest altogether. Kant had no idea of the consequences of such a failure. A loss meant that a link in the chain was broken, so the next link would not be able to connect properly. There was something even more important. If Kant were to lose in the ambush from the Jack Allens, every single last man would end up dead. If every single unit died in combat, the Oasis lookout would be retaken by the Jack Allen tribe. That meant Drondheim would be destroyed. Even if there were main quests from there on out, they would have nothing to do with Kant. Nothing else mattered if he ended up dead. Some years later, people in the dukedom of Leo would have learned of the tragedy. A few of them might have shed tears upon learning about it. In all likelihood, the tragedy would have turned into a topic discussed over dinner. After people raved about it for several days, everything would return to normal, with Kant eventually being forgotten. To hell with that. Kant clenched his fists and looked rather brutal. This was a battle that he was unable to afford to lose. He had to win, even if the victory came with a high cost. Get ready. Kant retreated and left the roof for the first floor of the council hall. The ten Swadian militia and twenty Swadian recruits were waiting with their spears in hand. These people consisted of his main force. They were the key to winning the battle. My lord. The soldiers looked determined. They were ready to die in battle if need be. Very well. Kant nodded, finding the morale to be impressively high. He asked, how are things out there? A militia member in charge of scouting immediately reported, the Jack Allens are gathering at the dunes. So far, it is estimated that there are five hundred of them. Kant frowned. The reported was just as he expected yet the weight on his shoulders felt even heavier than before. There were five hundred Jack Allens. That was a number close to that of the previous tribe that took over the oasis. How could there be so many of them? Kant was feeling doubtful. When twenty knights ambushed the tribe with thirty Swat Eans in tow, they had done severe damage to the Jack Allen tribe that had taken over the oasis lookout. There were about three hundred Jack Allens killed back then, and less than 100 had been able to escape. However, the number of Jack Allens appearing at the moment had reached 500. That surprised Kent quite a bit. It also greatly angered him. This meant that there was another Jack Allen tribe somewhere out there. They are attacking. Just when Kent was frowning and thinking, a militia member at the door made the announcement. His words made the air in the council hall instantly feel heavier. Sounds of gulping and teeth gnashing were heard. All of the Swadian soldiers held onto their spears and took deep breaths, awaiting Kant's orders. They were willing to charge outside the hall and form tight formations to take on the enemies outside at a moment's notice. Quiet. Stay quiet. However, Kant remained quiet. In a severe tone, he eventually said, Don't rush. Victory will be ours. He walked briskly to the wooden door. Through the cracks of the door, Kant was able to clearly see the dark silhouettes of the Jack Allens on the dunes bearing onto the oasis. It was apparent that the Jack Allens were unaware that the target of their ambush had discovered them. The Jack Allens continued to slowly sneak up on them. It was just like how wolf packs snuck up on their prey. They laid low for a while before suddenly charging when they got close enough attempting to kill their prey and reaping a tasty meal within the shortest amount of time possible. However, if said prey were to discover them and retaliate, things turned out differently. The soldiers in the council hall, the peasants in the tents, and the cavalry units in the lair were all waiting to strike. The stalkers were discovered. The ambush was no longer an ambush. It was now a quick retaliation. Precisely put, it was a counter-ambush. Bang! Kant kicked the wooden door and charged outside the council hall with his light crossbow. The five hundred Jack Allens, who were still laying low and approaching, looked very startled since they had gotten within ninety-eight feet from the council hall. 
none of them expected someone would suddenly kick the door open. Zoom! The light crossbow fired. A sharp, heavy iron bolt shot through the air, appearing within the ranks of the Jack Allens 98 feet away. The tip of the bolt tore through the hide of a Jack Allen and lodged in its abdomen, splitting up the internal organs within and causing massive internal bleeding. That Jack Allen fell to the ground with its hands covering its abdominal wound while its eyes became bloodshot. For Swadia, charge. Kant's voice was heard roaring throughout the Oasis lookout. While he was not being overly loud, his voice still sounded thunderous. All hail Swadia. Massive responses were heard. The thirty soldiers with spears in their hands quickly emerged from the council hall. They extended their two three-foot-long spears and formed neat formations, charging quickly at the stunned Jack Allens. There were also all of the fifty Swadian peasants. All of them raised their long scythes and followed at the flanks of the thirty infantry units. The steps they took suggested that they were jogging. They turned into the ones initiating an ambush, slaughtering the Jack Allens sneaking on them. Kill them all. Kant put the light crossbow behind his back and took out his short sword. He advanced along with the infantry units. The 98 feet was not that big of a distance. Reloading his crossbow would have taken too much time. It was better to deal with the threat using his short sword. Besides, none of the Jack Allens were wearing armor capable of withstanding hits from metal weapons. The stench of blood instantly thickened. The Swadians were already fighting up close and personal with the Jack Allens. Chapter 16, Irreconcilable Differences It was a very bloody and brutal battle. Different races went at each other's throats for a place to live. Nearly 500 Jack Allens gradually drew closer to them. Their beast-like heads had unmistakable anthropomorphic killing intent. The Oasis Lookout was where the Jack Allens had lived for generations. Humans taking over the oasis meant their home and lands had been robbed from them. It was a conflict that would have no peaceful end. Any race that wanted to survive in the desert either needed to drive away or kill the ones residing at any oasis found. Kant wanted to live, so he had to annihilate the Jack Allens. Drondheim needed to be developed. The deaths of the Jack Allens had to pave the way for that development. It was that simple. The law of the jungle was that of assimilation. In a desert, it was annihilation. One only needed to look at the Middle East of Earth, which had two river Rhine regions surrounded by deserts. Regardless of how many glorious civilizations had been built before, if they went into decline and ended up being conquered by other races or civilizations, they were eventually wiped out from the river of history. The lineage of such civilizations and people were broken, with only bits of historical ruins remaining behind to prove their bygone existence. As such, Kant showed no mercy. Besides, he was the invader in this situation. With things being as they were, there was no turning back. Withdrawing was not an option. The Jack Allens sneakily moved forward. With more than 500 of them crowding the place, the oasis seemed to be overflowing with blackened beings which inspired feverish confidence in those stupid yet brutal primitive beings. Their confidence was backed by the advantage of sheer numbers. Their arrogance was fueled by the fact that they remained undiscovered throughout the ambush process. However, none of the Jack Allens expected that their cover had been blown. The humans, who had been soundly sleeping, were simply waiting for the Jack Allens to show up. When the time came, they dropped their act and retaliated in an extremely ferocious manner. The retaliation was efficient and effective. The Jack Allens were almost in a panic because of their failed plan. The Jack Allen warriors standing at the forefront were only able to have their green eyes grow white as rows of pointy spears were thrust at them. Seething pain was felt in their abdomens before they were put to the ground by those weapons. They were able to do little else but open their eyes and fang-filled mouths wide in vain. The low-pitched noises they made were that of misery and despair as their lives were completely lost when they hit the ground. The two three-foot-long spears were lodged deep into their bodies, creating irreparable wounds. The spiked clubs they held were unable to do any damage to the humans holding the other end of the spears. The cold sheen of the spearheads was stained red under the bright moonlight. 
The Swadian infantry units, which were all armed with spears, served as the main force of the battle. Their iron spearheads, which were meticulously forged by skilled blacksmiths, easily penetrated the bodies of the Jack Allens. Further damage was done by the hands holding the spears. As they slightly twisted the sharp weapons, it caused internal organs to rupture and massively bleed. The spears were quickly pulled and thrust once again with full force. Blood splattered all over the place. The thick stench of blood permeated throughout the cold desert. The throng of spears had been an infantry tactic employed by the Kingdom of Swadia. As the former strongest old kingdom found in the continent of Karadia, before those in the mountains southwest of the Kingdom of Swadia revolted, the people of the Rhodic Mountains had been the best candidates to employ such formations. However, even when the Rhodics, who were known to be as stubborn as rocks, were lost, the Swadians were still capable of employing the Legion of Spears. The adept skills gained from training enabled the soldiers to skewer the Jack Allens inside out without breaking a sweat. All hail Swadia! Kant shouted as he brought his sharp blade down on the throat of a Jack Allen who had fallen but was still alive. He was boosting the morale of all the combatants on the field. There was no voice comparable to that of a lord's encouragement. It meant that everyone was still fighting alongside their lord and there were still ample compatriots left standing to fight. It was also a sign that they had yet to lose. All hail Swadia! The Swadian peasants shouted as well. They closely followed by the sides of the infantry combatants. Their long scythes, which had been converted from farming tools, were being brought down left, right, and center like they were sabers and halberds. The left bloody wounds on the Jack Allens that never wore armor. More than thirty Jack Allens died as soon as close quarters fighting erupted. However, Kant and his men never let that go to their heads. They remained determined as they advanced. They also suffered casualties. No, save me ugh. The shrieks of Swadian peasants were heard from the flanks. Some of them were pounced on by Jack Allens. Spiked clubs filled with iron nails were brought down hard on them. The peasants did not wear armor, so they were only able to rely on their bodies to resist the attacks. The outcome was brutal. Hugh help me. More of them were being brought down to the ground by spiked clubs of the Jack Allens. Their wounds were rendered indistinguishable by the nails on the clubs. However, most of the injuries were concussive damage dealt by the weight of the clubs, which went all the way into their bones. They no longer needed to worry about further damage. The Jack Allens tore out their throats right after they were downed. Seven Swadian peasants fell and lost their lives. Hold the line. Hold the line. Kant's eyes were bloodshot. Those peasants were an important part of his workforce. It was quite a waste to see them lost in the battle. Then again, the casualties thus far were still considered tolerable. Kant gritted his teeth and shouted, Maintain tight formations and press on. I. The infantry units by his side responded loudly. While there had been peasants lost, the main force of the battle still had firm control of the battlefield situation. None of them had been injured. On the contrary, the Jack Allens no longer dared to press forward head-on at the advancing army formations. They began to scatter at the flanks, leaving behind more than twenty bodies. Those Jack Allens knew that without armor and shields, they had no chance of getting past the throng of spears. Even if the Jack Allens managed to make it to the flanks, the peasants still gritted their teeth as they brought their long scythes down onto the beasts. They were doing it for their home. They were doing it for their village. They were doing it for their kingdom. The Swadian peasants were just as willing to put their lives on the line to defend what they held dear. They had to put their lives on the line. The brutal retaliation threw the Jack Allens off guard. This was the opportunity Kant had anticipated. He planned to shock the Jack Allens into fear by causing massive casualties in a short amount of time. It would cause the Jack Allens to lose morale, which served as the key to their victory. The courage of a single individual was not necessarily constant. The Jack Allens, being of creatures of flesh and blood, were not actually fearless. They were very capable of fear. 
the sudden retaliation did not give the stunned Jack Allens any time to recover. Seeing their skewered compatriots lying on the ground, the lucky ones, who managed to escape the purge of the tribe before, seemed to have recalled all the fear they experienced the previous night. There had been the sounds of horses galloping, shouting, killing, swords cutting through necks, and blood spraying. All of that served to inspire massive fear. Gallop gallop gallop. The Jack Allens retreated in fear, subconsciously dropping their crudely made spiked clubs, which were cobbled together with wood and nails. However, they remained oblivious to the terror that was about to appear. The sound of horses galloping could be heard. That was the sound they feared most when they escaped in the night before. Kill them all. Shouts were heard as six cavalry units seemingly emerged out of nowhere in the night. Shortly after, heavy javelins appeared. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Sounds of things tearing through the air were heard right before the pointy javelins, which traveled over forty feet, nailed six Jack Allens, who had not managed to escape, onto the ground. All six of those riders held their spears out and crashed into the flanks of the messy formation of the Jack Allens like meteors. Their massive inertia sent several unlucky ones flying while the pointy spears penetrated several Jack Allens. The weapons put them to the ground writhing in pain, and they were unable to do anything about it. Those were the only cavalry units who served Kant the Desert Bandits. All hail Swadia! The appearance of those six desert bandits boosted the morale of the infantry units around Kant. They quickly cheered, feeling their spirits rise. The spears in their hands were covered in blood. The bodies of Jack Allens were sprawled all over the place before them. Do it now. Kant looked at the fettered Jack Allens, which all wore fearful expressions. He realized that the Jack Allens had recalled the appearance of the knights from the previous night as well as their tribe members dropping off left and right around them. All of that caused them to lose morale, so much so that they wanted to immediately escape. Forces dealt a crushing blow saw their morale quickly dissipate when met with the same trauma in a short period of time. That was what the Jack Allens were experiencing. More than 100 Jack Allens retreated in fear. Although they had been sneaking about in the dark of night, they did not know if other cavalry units were lurking about. They quickly retreated. In their haste to retreat, they were fully willing to drop the spiked clubs they were holding. They all succumbed to mass panic. None of them had an ounce of courage left for fighting. The mass panic was so severe that the other Jack Allens began to flee in fear. Fear and low morale quickly spread. More than 100 Jack Allen bodies were left behind in the desert, but more Jack Allens chose to flee in terror. The battle ended very quickly. Stop pursuing them and come back. Kant gave his orders. He denied the desert bandits' request to give chase on their horses. He only had six desert bandits at his disposal. Losing even one of them was too great a loss. Furthermore, the desert bandits only served as light cavalry units specializing in shock tactics. Their defenses paled significantly when compared to the dukedom knights, who were all well trained and wore male armor. Kant stood at the edge of the oasis, watching the Jack Allens disappear into the dunes. His expression became somewhat less harsh. He had won the battle. He shook his head and said, clean the battlefield up. He looked at the peasants to the side, whom all wore sorrowful faces. He sighed heavily and said, calculate the casualties. Report to me once you're done. Understood. A desert bandit nodded which meant that he took the assignment. Kant stood where he was. A dialog box suddenly appeared on his retina. However, his expression soon turned to one of worry. He was unable to help but clench his fists as he muttered, We were lucky to have won this one. Chapter 17, Troop Class Upgrade After the Battle We were almost done for. Kant breathed a sigh of relief, yet his expression remained glum. That victory had truly been a lucky one. He understood just how incredibly fortunate he had been in that battle. If luck had not been on his side, he might have ended up having to move away from the oasis. Worse yet, he might have. 
Without luck, Kent and the people of Drontheim would have been chased away from the oasis lookout by those Jack Allens. They would have been forced to drift throughout the brutal desert, spending everything they had before finally escaping back into the dukedom of Leo. He would have survived in disgrace, forcing him to live the rest of his life hiding his name. The 500 Jack Allens were more than enough to be called a battalion. Even in the dukedom of Leo, that number would have caught the attention of the lords of the local fiefs. While the Jack Allens were no doubt still at a primitive stage and had no civilization to speak of, so much so that they were not even able to produce iron tools, their feral and bloodthirsty temperament made them a terrible threat. They were not all that much better than mere beasts. However, it was fortunate that the Jacqueline's feral temperament eclipsed their capacity for reasoning. Beasts that were incapable of sophisticated thoughts would always be beasts. Kant shook his head. The look of feeling lucky to have survived was in his eyes. There were two main reasons his forces were able to crush the Jack Allens in the battle. First, they had been able to deal out massive casualties against the enemy in a short time. Second, there had been a bloody massacre the day before. All of that served to shock the lucky escapees to the core. It was an overwhelming victory in a psychological sense. The Jack Allens, which had been suffering severe psychological trauma, quickly grew fearful. Thus, they retreated and eventually ran away. More Jack Allens from elsewhere ran away with them. That became the crumbling of the Jack Allens formations throughout the front line. By then, if some of them had been able to organize defenses to prevent the entire army of Jack Allens from falling apart and stabilize the restless beasts, it would have been Kant's forces that fell apart next. Luckily, for Kant, that did not happen. The Jack Allens had no military organization. As such, they had no concept of barrier troops and reserves. The scale of victory in that battle eventually tipped in Kant's favor. That was why Kant felt lucky. That was also why he thought the battle was won because of luck. Not only was Kant's forces severely outnumbered, but they were also lacking in more ways than one. His Swadian forces consisted only of entry-level units, which were actually low-quality troops. Few of them could guarantee their fighting prowess. For instance, the 10 Swadian militia and 20 Swadian recruits, who all wore leather armor and were armed with standard military equipment, as well as had been painstakingly trained and mastered killing techniques in the battlefield, would have served as effective combatants. The fighting prowess of those people was practically guaranteed. However, there had only been 30 infantry units in his line of defense. The majority of his forces, the main combatants of his formation, consisted of the 50 Swadian peasants. They were skilled at farming and most other menial labor. Some of them were even capable of working in workshops. However, they wore no armor and had poor combat experience. They were not very capable of using that long scythes that had been modified from farm tools. They lacked strength and nimbleness when compared to the Jack Allens, and they performed poorly in combat. The only advantage they had over the Jack Allens was that the long scythes they held were metal weapons. Those advanced weapons were capable of dealing effective damage against the Jack Allens, which did not wear armor. Then again, despite being armed with metal weapons, casualties among the Swadian peasants remained high. F asterisk CK. Kant slightly gritted his teeth. The thick stench of blood still lingered around his nose, which made his head ache. He turned around to carefully scan the battlefield. The place was littered with dead bodies. Most of them were Jack Allens. Their blood-stained grey fur and beast-like heads were unmistakable. Although they wore ragged linen clothing, they still did not resemble humans. They looked more like beasts. There were also quite a number of Swadians who wore linen robes and hoods among the bodies. It was apparent that those peasants gave their lives in the intense battle to defend Drondheim. My lord, the statistics are out. The desert bandit walked up to him quickly, wearing a serious expression. The casualties were apparently heavy. Speak, Kant said. None of the infantry units died. Six suffered light injuries. The desert bandit hesitated for a bit before saying, as for the peasants, 
36, suffered light injuries his tone was shifty and suddenly halted. Kant frowned and said, go on. He knew that the desert bandit, who had been tasked with the calculations, was about to tell him how many died. Kant was psychologically prepared. Yes, my lord. The desert bandit gulped for a bit before continuing in a severe tone, as for the peasants, 36, suffered light injuries and 15 are dead. Fifteen peasants died. Kant's voice was slightly raised. That somewhat exceeded his expectations. Then again, it was within expectations for a battle. Hey! Kant clenched his fist and pondered for a bit with his head hung low. He nodded and said, give them a proper burial. Understood. The desert bandit nodded. That was the least he could do after such a bloody battle. They died for the sake of Kant's fief. As their lord, be it in the game or reality, he was compelled to at least give them a proper burial. Clean up the battlefield, people. After he was done with the arrangements, Kant turned around and headed back into the council hall. At the same time, he ordered, I'll leave you in charge of the rest. Rest assured, my lord. The desert bandit nodded. Kant went inside. The desert bandit was a sensible person. Although he was not someone capable of solving a lot of problems for Kant like a tavern hero, he had the capacity to shoulder some of Kant's burden. That was especially so when it came to dealing with simple tasks in this world. As for Kant, it was time for him to savor the fruits of his victory. Suddenly, the reward from the system came. Ding after a gruesome battle, the enemy was crushed. Main quest, annihilate the enemy sneaking in the night is complete. Reward acquired, hunting crossbow distributed, available only to Swadian militia. Comment, it was an intense battle. The courage to do or die made the victory praiseworthy. The completion of the main quest brought him his reward. He laid on the bed, which was on the council hall's second floor. He couldn't help but frown. Hunting crossbow distributed? What does that mean? Kant asked the system without making a sound. The reward permits your Swadian militia to be equipped with hunting crossbows. From here on out, every troop member who is upgraded will be equipped with a hunting crossbow and quiver of bolts. The system quickly answered. However, Kant was baffled. Is this the reward? Indeed. The voice of the system continued without any emotional inflection, you acquire more than just actual items when you complete quests which includes armaments for your troop classes. Kant nodded. Not bad. The Swadian militia was Kant's only main infantry force. It was best to be able to enhance their combat prowess. He seemed to have recalled that as well. The Swadian militia, a third-level troop class in the game back in his past life, had some of them equipped with hunting crossbows. While the hunting crossbows were, per their namesake, crossbows used for hunting, they were still considered ranged weapons in warfare. The ability to shoot enemy troops and weaken them before crossing arms up close and personal was the best method. Ding your forces have upgradable units. There was more than one prompt from the system. Kant willed the prompts open. It was an important dialogue box concerning upgrading his forces. Upgradable troop class, Swadian peasants x35. Spend 10 dinars each to upgrade to Swadian recruits. Kant was startled. Did every peasant who fought in that battle become upgradable? With the 15 dead being taken out of the equation, there were 35 Swadian peasants among his population. All of them were able to level up to become a first-level troop class. Although Swadian recruits looked weak, this upgrade almost completely changed the fundamentals. The peasants, who had once known only farming, were to be turned into trained recruits. A peasant and a recruit were of totally different professions. Becoming a recruit marked the start of a true military career. However, that was not all he heard from the system. The dialogue box from the system continued. Upgradable troop class, Swadian recruits x20. Spend 10 dinars each to upgrade to Swadian militia. Just like how it was with the peasants, the Swadian recruits were able to be promoted to the militia. Kant gulped. 
he continued scrolling through the system prompts instead of rushing to make any decisions. Upgradable Troop Class, Swadian Militia X10 Spend 20 dinars each to upgrade to Swadian Footmen slash Swadian Skirmishers. That was the true key to the upgrades. The third level troop class was the only troop class considered a main armed force in the system. Those classes were two of the three pillars of the Kingdom of Swadia's military organizations. The first was Swadian Footmen, which specialized in melee combat. The second was Swadian Skirmishers, which specialized in ranged combat. There was no doubt that the Swadian footmen could continue to be upgraded to either Swadian man at arms. That eventually led to upgrading them to Swadian knights. Such was the route of upgrades laid down by the system. Very good, very good indeed. Kant lightly gulped. Even if he were unable to get to the level of man at arms or knights, the current third level troop classes would suffice. Zero-level peasants working with a small number of first- and second-level troop classes enabled him to take on the Jack Allens. Now, Kant had acquired a third level of main force units, as well as a huge number of first- and second-level auxiliary troop classes. His forces had significantly grown in terms of fighting prowess. The leap was of different orders of magnitude. Chapter 18, Choice of Buildings The Jack Allens scattered in fright. The bloody battle for ownership of the Oasis Lookout was declared over at the same time. Kant emerged as the winner. This baron, who had his title conferred in the Dukedom of Leo, was the Lord of Naran Desert and owner of the fief at the Oasis Lookout. Then again, titles and status only mattered back in the Dukedom of Leo. The Jack Allen tribes, which had bred in the Naran Desert for many years, had no concept of that. They were completely oblivious to such things, which meant that none of them would acknowledge Kant's status. In their eyes, Kant was little more than an invader. That was a truth Kant did not deny. That was the nature of a world in which might makes right continuously prevailed. More often than not, the one with the bigger stick could hoard everything. Weaklings did not even deserve to live. I am included. Kant was indifferent to it all. These were the true values when the facade called civilization was stripped away. It was a world in which people gobbled each other up and races constantly exterminated one another. There was no such thing as mercy. Kant making it all the way to the Naran Desert meant that he had to fight for ownership of the Naran Desert, as well as the water source of the Oasis Lookout, with those brutal and beastly Jack Allens. It was all so that he could survive in the desert and develop his fief. Furthermore, Kant was the winner of that battle. The win meant he was the one. Winning that battle was, in truth, more than just securing victory. It was also a turning point. This turning point signified that he was on his way to becoming powerful. All 35 peasants were upgradable. All 20 recruits were upgradable. All 10 militias were upgradable. The 65 units at Kant's disposal were upgradable to become higher-level troop classes. All of them would become infantry units capable of fighting in low-intensity battles. While the number of troops at his disposal was lower due to the casualties suffered during the battle, the quality of his troops after the upgrade was an obvious increase. One could have said that the growth was exponential. For instance, he had started his journey with 50 Swadian peasants. The remaining 35 peasants became upgradable after 15 died. They were now Swadian recruits. All 35 of them were stronger, wore leather armor, and held spears. They were able to fight using hand axes and defend themselves using shields in melee battles, which were standard Kingdom of Swadia military equipment. All of them had also received basic tactical training. That is worth upgrading. Kant nodded in silence. He thoughtfully made his decision. The Jacqueline's ambush that night had been a lesson he would never forget. They were in the Naran Desert, so the threat of Jack Allen tribes lurked everywhere and at all times. The emergence of nearly 500 Jack Allens that night alone enabled him to speculate that there were probably more Jack Allen tribes hiding out there somewhere. The Dukedom of Leo had little knowledge about the Naran Desert. The conquest ten years ago was declared over when the fighting reached the Oasis Lookout. As for the deeper reaches of the Naran Desert, 
which was located north of the Oasis Lookout, be it a Jack Allen Tribe Oasis or Hidden Water Resource, nothing was really known. Anything regarding such things remained a mystery. At present, these were the things Kant had to deal with, which meant that he needed to be prepared. I need to level up, regardless if I like it or not. It needs to be done for the future of the fief. Only when Kant and Drondheim amassed enough power to defend themselves could the development of the Oasis Lookout be guaranteed. Otherwise, regardless of how painstakingly he worked to make the place prosper, it would eventually be like making a new fief for some greedy people out there to steal. That was a certain outcome if he lacked forces formidable enough to defend his creation. It would be like handing his fief over to others on a silver platter. As such, Kant thought his troops needed to be upgraded. Even if the amount of dinars spent was hefty, he needed to get them upgraded so the development of the village remained unimpeded. Upgrading 35 Swadian peasants to Swadian recruits required 350 dinars. Upgrading 20 Swadian recruits to Swadian militias required 200 dinars. As first level troop classes, the individual cost for an upgrade was 10 dinars. That's 550 dinars. Kant frowned thinking of the number. However, he unflinchingly said, confirm upgrade. The numbers symbolizing the dinars he owned quickly dropped. Out of the 1,000 dinars he had acquired from completing the main quest of building his village, 420 dinars remained after the numbers stopped dropping. Half of Kant's savings had once again been spent. Now then. Kant's frown slightly deepened. The ten Swadian militias were also available for upgrade. Upgrading each of them required 20 dinars each. There was an option of upgrading them to become a melee class in the form of Swadian footmen or to become a ranged class in the form of Swadian skirmishers. Those two classes were the Kingdom of Swadia's third-level troop classes. If they underwent another upgrade, they would reach the fourth level of troop classes. That was only a level below the fifth level troop class, which was the top class of main forces on the battlefield. However, Kant declined to upgrade the ten Swadian militias. It was a decision he came to after thinking things through. Although the 200 dinars required for upgrading all of them did not seem much, it would affect further development of the village. Drondheim, at the moment, was in the early stages of development. He required huge sums of dinars to construct other buildings, for instance, houses, which were available for construction but had not been built. There were also city walls, mills, watchtowers, and wells. All of these structures were basic facilities the village desperately needed. The only building the village currently had was the council hall. Although the other building, the desert bandit lair, was right next to the council, it was a building for recruiting desert bandits. It was independent of the series of Kingdom of Swadia buildings. He needed to hurry up with the construction of the village. As for the Jack Allens, all the infantry units I have at the moment will do. Kant's expression remained calm. He had 35 Swadian recruits and 30 Swadian militias at his disposal, which was a force of 65 units. They could easily guard the Oasis lookout. Even if they met with the same amount of Jack Allens again, Kant's victory was guaranteed. Unlike the peasants, those were tried and true infantry units. Although they were still low-level troop classes, the standard Swadian armament they were equipped with meant that the primitive Jack Allens, who lacked even metal weapons, stood no chance against them. Furthermore, the Swadian militias were already equipped with ranged weaponry. They had received hunting crossbows. They were the lowest level and least powerful crossbows provided by the system. Crossbows were usually used by hunters in the mountains as a tool for hunting. Their performance on the battlefield, which allowed for shooting enemies from afar, was an added feature. Regardless of how unimpressive the crossbow was, it was still a crossbow. A crossbow capable of hunting animals could kill enemies all the same. Furthermore, they were only needed to deal with the Jack Allens which lacked armor and only had their physical fortitude to rely on. The 30 Swadian militias could easily serve as crossbowmen. After all, they had decently performed when fighting up close and personal. With 35 Swadian recruits working in tandem with them, 
they would perform well against the Jack Allens. That's how it is for now. Kant confirmed his choices. The dialogue box on his retina gradually disappeared. The soldiers, who he saw outside the window, were still cleaning up the battlefield. The fight had spanned the entire oasis and sand beyond. All of them were instantly wrapped in data streams. They appeared in the world two seconds later with apparent changes. All of them looked more physically fit. Their equipment had been swapped out. The greatest change occurred to the Swadian militias. Hunting crossbows were seen hanging underneath the kite shields on their backs. There were also quivers strapped to their sides, which neatly held twenty bolts each. They were done getting their upgrades. A cold wind blew, kicking up loose sand. Before they realized it, a line of white light appeared on the eastern horizon of the Naran Desert. Dawn was approaching. Kant, who was lying on his bed, did not feel like sleeping. The threat of the Jack Allens was over for the time being. The troop classes gained after the upgrade solved the lack of adequate defense forces problem. However, that meant that it was time to focus on developing his village. Another dialogue box appeared on his retina. It was a list of buildings available for construction in Drondheim. Construction list. House, city wall, mill, watchtower, well. The introduction and images suggested that these buildings were not all that different from those in the game. Kant took a good look. House, civilian building of stone and wooden materials. It increases population and attracts an influx of citizens when the population in the village is low. Requires 100 dinars and 7 days for construction. Mill, agricultural building that could be powered either by wind or water. It is capable of crushing wheat and other crops for producing flour. Requires 200 dinars and 14 days for construction. City wall, military building consisting only of rocks piled to a height of 1.6 feet surrounding the village. It is mainly used for preventing livestock from escaping into the wild instead of being used for defense against enemy attacks. Requires 100 dinars and 7 days for construction. Watchtower military building of stone and wooden materials. Personnel could be assigned within to spot movements as early as possible to keep the village safe. Requires 100 dinars and 7 days for construction. Well, civilian building constructed by digging into the ground. Underground water sources are required or wells dug will not produce water. Requires 100 dinars and 7 days for construction. These were the five buildings currently available to Kant for construction. However, he slightly frowned. It seems like some buildings would be useless. Kant scanned the dialogue box and felt somewhat exasperated after reading the introductions. Drondheim was located in the Naran Desert. There were at least two out of five buildings that served no use to the village in its present state. Wells. No need for that given that the oasis has a water source. Kant frowned as he continued selecting. No wheat fields, so no need for mills. However, his frown became even more intense as he continued to read the dialogue box. I have no need for houses since I'll be getting them from quest rewards anyway. A city wall is also useless. It wouldn't be tall enough to defend against Jack Allen attacks anyway. His expression grew tenser as he thought. Kant frowned and thought. It seems like the watchtower is the only one of any use. The capability to detect anything going on around earlier was important. Therefore, giving the village an early warning system made the watchtower the only building out of the five that fit his current situation best. The threat of the Jack Allens attacking at some unknown time was always present. With the watchtower in place, he gained the ability to detect such threats early and, therefore, enabled everyone in the file to prepare and strike much sooner. It would assist them in gaining a quicker victory in the event of an attack. Chapter 19, Burial Below the Dunes System, Construct the Watchtower Kant willed it in his mind and connected to the system. At the same time, the location of the construction was placed on the eastern side of the council hall. If anything were to happen, the ones above on sentry duty could report to Kant in time, enabling him to make decisions as early as possible. 
100 dinars spent. Watchtower, under construction. Completion, 7 days. The system's dialog box appeared and briefed him on everything. Kan suddenly heard some noise outside. Many people seemed to be moving a lot of things. Someone was shouting orders. However, none of it sounded like his Swadian infantry units. It seemed more like the sounds of the peasants. What the hell is happening? Kant frowned. He approached the window and peered outside. Sunlight was subtly dispelling the dark of night. Dawn arrived in mere moments. I better get up now. That night sure passed quickly. He took a deep breath and got up from his bed. Besides, he did not feel like sleeping at all. After fighting such a bloody battle the previous night, Kan still felt rather excited. He had never actually felt like sleeping anyway. He pushed the door of his room open and went downstairs. Good morning, my lord. A thick voice greeted him as soon as he walked out of the council hall. Kant turned around and saw a stout peasant wearing simple linen clothing. The peasant bowed respectfully and said, We are a team of builders who came from Praven. We are here to construct your watchtower. Hey? Oh, right. Kant was slightly baffled. He quickly nodded in reply. It seemed logical that the system would have assigned a construction team for the new building. He turned around to look at the side of the council hall. Next to it were stacks of stone and wooden materials. Kant was certain that the place was empty before he walked out of the council hall. However, as the builders began to move the stones and hammer the wooden materials together, emitting loud clangs as they went, he knew those construction materials also came from the system. The system had provided fifteen builders. All of them were stout, middle-aged men. They wore deadpan expression and seemed as if they were men of few words. The foreman was the exception. My lord, there are a few things I wish to make clear to you. He humbled himself in a manner unbefitting of his appearance and said, We will be at your service for seven days, ensuring the completion of the watchtower. During that time, we request that you ensure we get ample food and water, as well as a reasonable amount of rest. Kant nodded. It is imperative that I do so. The foreman of the builders awkwardly smiled and added, and, we don't participate in battles. You will have no part in any. Kant shook his head. He felt that the foreman's cowardly and meticulous temperament was rather ridiculous. Very well, very well then. The foreman nodded a few times. His expression suggested that he felt rather lucky. Kant understood all that from briefing he had received. This was probably a rule laid down by the system. Besides, a builder's only job was to construct buildings. Combat was something that Kant needed to take care of. Carry on, Kant said to the building foreman before heading elsewhere. He arrived at the battlefield from the previous night. The stench of blood lingered throughout the area. Blood stains were scattered about on the sand. These were the signs of an intense and bloody battle. The Swadian infantry units had gathered the bodies, which had been sprawled everywhere. The Jack Allen bodies continued to burn in a hole the peasants had dug during the night. Several new holes in the ground were dug not far away from a dune. Two desert bandits were lighting the clothes beneath the bodies with a torch. The smell of burned meat wafted throughout the place as the intense flames consumed the hole. Burning was an efficient way to deal with dead bodies. When the bodies of the Jack Allens were reduced to ashes, they would bury the ashes in the sand, leaving practically no trace behind. As for the fifteen dead Swadian peasants, they deserved better treatment. After all, they had all been brave subjects who died for Kant's sake. May they rest in peace. Kant came to another dune. He saw fifteen graves being dug. The Swadian recruits and Swadian militias, as well as the six desert bandits, were gathered there. All of them wore somber expression. Although they hardly knew each other, and, truth to be told, they only knew each other for two days, all of them still shared a connected sentiment as Swadians. The people attending the funeral behaved respectfully toward their dead compatriots. Yet, it was still a funeral. It was hardly ceremonious, 
but they did everything they were able to given the current circumstances. This is truly a pity. Kant's expression was full of regret. He was almost always calm. Now, hints of emotions could be seen. He knew that more troops would be lost in the wars that were to come. Nonetheless, this was the first time some of his people had died. That served as a warning for Kant. If he neglected the development of his fief, he would die frustrated and a nobody just like that. The attendees still wore serious expressions despite the funeral being soon over. Kant asked for cremation to prevent contaminating any underground water sources. However, all the peasants who perished had individual graves. They each had a grave marker carved from wood, which was placed right beneath the dune. The markers were thoughtfully placed as a symbol of watching over the oasis lookout to the west, as well as Drondheim, which they fought bravely to defend. If you can hear us, then please watch over us. Kant watched the fires in the graves burn and was unable to help but sigh. Despite having only arrived at the oasis lookout two days ago, they had already gone through two brutal battles. He quickly learned just how merciless the Naran desert could be. The desert was a world of difference compared to the peace in the dukedom of Leo. The number of humans and Jack Allens who ended up dead in just two days probably amounted to the total number of executed criminals for the past five years in the dukedom. Then again, they had to move on. When the funeral was over, Kant returned to the council hall. The recruits and militia members scattered and organized patrols and guard duty among themselves, continuing to protect their village and the oasis. All of you, come with me. Kant waved at the six desert bandits, telling them to go to the council hall. He had assignments for them. My lord. The six desert bandits walked briskly inside and stood respectfully before him. At ease. Kant extended his hand, telling them to lose the ceremonial attitude. He sat on a wooden chair in the council hall. He put his arms on the table and said, I plan to have you all search the depths of the Naran desert. I want you to find the possible location of the alkali soil and see if there are any Jack Allen tribes around. There is definitely alkali soil somewhere out there. One of the desert bandits nodded and said, We will find it. However, another bandit frowned and added, As for the Jack Allen tribes, there are definitely some around us. Maybe the two are connected. Do you mean with the alkali soil? Kant asked with a frown. Indeed. That desert bandit spoke in a serious tone. More than 500 Jack Allen warriors appeared during the ambush in the night. Not only does that mean that there are Jack Allen tribes around, but it also means that their tribes are more powerful than the one that previously took over the Oasis lookout. I figured as much. Kant nodded. He had speculated the same thing deep down. Kant was silent for a brief moment before frowning and saying, that is also why I need you all to go deep into the desert and find out the cause in the north. The six desert bandits stood up solemnly, awaiting further words. Kant's eyes were grim as he said, We are in the light while the Jack Allens hide in the shadows. We don't know where their tribes are, and we have no idea if there are any oasis deep in the desert. Things are not in our favor. We lack intel on our side. The six desert bandits nodded in agreement. They were people used to blackmailing and robbing people in the dunes, so they knew just how important intelligence was. No, I should head out with all of you. Kant suddenly spoke such words. Hey. That line messed up the plans the desert bandits had. One of them quickly said, My lord, there are a lot of unknown dangers lurking in the desert. It's far too dangerous for you to head out with us. Kant shook his head. His eyes shone with determination. I've made up my mind. His warhorse was still in the stable, which was one of the thoroughbred steeds available to knights and squires of the dukedom. His horse was comparable to the desert horses rode by the desert bandits. It was almost comparable to a third-level horse in the system. Furthermore, it was the best among those third-level horses. Even if they were to meet any Jack Allens, the horses would leave them in the dust without any problems. The mobility of cavalry units was several times higher than that of infantry's. Seeing how determined their lord was, 
the six bandits had no choice but to nod. We shall do everything we can to protect you. Well, get food and water ready. Kant nodded and added, we ride at once. The desert bandits nodded and left. They went out to prepare the supplies needed for treading the desert, especially fresh water. More than a dozen water sacks were filled, ensuring that all seven of them had enough to last for two days. More than 500 Jack Allens had assaulted them the previous night. There were still about 400 of them left when they scattered and fled. Kant and the desert bandits aimed to track the Jack Allens' footsteps to the tribe from which they came. To no one's strength, as well as that of the enemy, was required for victory. By then, whether it involved arranging for further defense or striking out proactively, they would know who they were about to hit. At the very least, they no longer needed to do so while being kept in the dark about everything. As long as Kant was able to amass his forces to a sufficient strength, he could crush the Jack Allen tribe outright and take the oasis, which had once allowed the Jack Allens to survive. A desert oasis, which was capable of sustaining crops, was good something treasured in a desert. The Jack Allens had hit him, so he deemed it only fair to hit them back. Everything he planned to do could only be possible if he could secure the location of the Jack Allen tribe. It created the potential for Kant's forces to rush them at a determined time, such as the dark of night right before dawn. That also happened to be the time when people were at their drowsiest. It was best to hit those Jack Allens hard at such an optimal time. He was out to make sure that his attacks would cripple them for good. Chapter 20, The Huge Tribe in the Desert the early morning sun in the Naran desert remained scorching. Kant flicked his reins and rode forward. The six well-armed and well-equipped desert bandits were right behind him, riding their desert horses. Their eyes were alert and cautious without the slightest hint of slacking. They were behaving as if enemies were laying low somewhere and would spring up at any given moment. They headed for the deeper reaches of the desert. They were out to look for the Jack Allen tribe that had assaulted the Oasis lookout the night before. Look over there. Kant stopped his horse and narrowed his eyes, peering at the dune before them. There were some holes visible in the sand. Kant exhaled slowly. He turned around and said, It looks like we're on the right course, people. The tracks they left behind are quite obvious. The desert bandits followed them. In a very obvious scornful tone, one of them said, So, those dogs really have no idea how to survive in the desert. If these dogs had shown up in the desert of Sarand, there would be nothing left of them. The other desert bandits looked on with the same disdain and scorn. Conflict was everywhere throughout the continent of Karadia. The incessant wars all over the place forced the desert bandits into becoming desert experts. They looked at the obvious tracks in the desert which in their eyes might have as well been the Jack Allens saying, Hey, I was here. Did you know? Follow these tracks, and you'll be able to find my lair. Come quickly. We're all very eager to get butchered by you people. This is ridiculous. Kant nodded with a scornful smirk on his face. He kicked the belly of his horse lightly and flicked his reins before plainly saying, Let's continue moving. Stay sharp understood. All of the desert bandits replied unanimously. As cavalry units, their mobility within a short time frame was far superior to the Jack Allens, which were all infantry units. They tracked the obvious, messy trail in the sand as they moved further into the desert. They had no worries about routes and direction as long as they did not encounter a sandstorm. Their horses had left tracks behind, which was something unique in the Naran Desert. None of the Jack Allens rode horses. They did not even have a concept of taming horses. Those tameable creatures, which could have served as important assets to cavalry units, were little more than prey in the eyes of the Jack Allens. Furthermore, there were hardly any horses found in the desert. They would have just been more creatures dying of thirst. In a desert, there was nothing but endless sand. The place was also a symbol of extreme infertility. From Kant's perspective, the Naran Desert was such a barren place that it was far harsher and far more brutal than any deserts he knew of. It could hardly sustain any living beings. 
That image was cemented deeper into his mind as they ventured further into the desert. There were rarely even trees known for their hardiness against draft in that desert. Except for the few found near the oasis, no green was found in a place without an ounce of water. There were only vast swaths of yellow sand, which seemed to be out to consume everything. The desert was practically like purgatory. Kant looked grim. As they ventured deeper into the desert, the barrenness of the place filled his mind. Who the heck would live in a place like this? He gulped. His mouth was so parched that he felt as if he was able to spit fire. The six desert bandits behind him shared the same sentiment and conditions. One of them was perceptive enough to take one of the water sacks on the back of his horse and thrust it toward Kant. My lord, you best have some water. Right. Kant nodded and took the water sack. The water felt cool to the touch. It was spring water gathered from the pond at the oasis lookout. He took a huge gulp. The water tasted sweet and had a cooling effect. The spring water washed the anxiousness and heat he felt deep down somewhat, but he still felt heavy. The quest this time was to locate the Jack Allen tribe, as well as search for the alkali soil that was possibly out there. However, they spent one whole morning finding nothing, which frustrated him. He did not want to return empty-handed. Let's move on and hurry up. It's almost noon. Kant gave his command as he continued riding forward, hastening their speed. The six desert bandits behind him nodded. They wiped the water marks off from around the corner of their mouths and placed the water sacks back where they belonged before riding out at the same speed. All of them were cavalry units. Their current speed was over ten times faster when compared to the speed that Kant's entourage had traveled when they first left the Seenway range and headed to the Oasis lookout. Since they had a clear trail to follow, the squad of seven people rode very quickly. They took a short break at noon. When the sun was no longer as high and the temperature had lowered somewhat, they continued on their scouting mission. They rode until the sun was setting and evening came. Kant and the desert bandits finally stopped riding. The messy trail beneath them led to a place with numerous tents, which were just little more than 328 feet away. They had found the Jack Allen tribe. Kant's pupils slightly contracted. The desert bandits by his side got off of their horses before he said anything. They led their desert horses to hide behind a dune to avoid the Jack Allens, which had extremely high numbers detecting them and causing any unnecessary trouble. Kant also leaped off of his horse. He handed the reins to a desert bandit behind him. He headed to the top of the dune and carefully lowered himself. He observed the tribe. This tribe seems to be far larger than the one back at the oasis lookout. He paused for a bit and added, three times larger at least. More than that maybe. The eyes of the two desert bandits who followed behind him looked harsh. The tribe, as they observed, was huge. Tents cobbled together with all manner of materials were messily sprawled all over the sand. There was only a hint of planning or order. The Jack Allens, which had tusks growing out of their lower jaws and grey fur all over their bodies, walked around and about the tents at will, making the place look like a slum. Garbage and leftover bones littered the place. There was even excrement that seemed to have covered the sand where the tribe was located. There were a good number of young Jack Allens playing and rolling about in the excrement as if the excrement was just clean clay and none of it was dirty. They had no concept of dirtiness to speak of at all. This is disgusting. Kant spat at his side. He finally understood why there was always a stench to the Jack Allens. He found the reason right there and then. My lord, bad news indeed. A desert bandit said in a serious tone, from what we can see, there are about 2,000 adult Jack Allens and 200 adolescents. If nothing were to go wrong, this would be a very well-developed Jack Allen tribe. Well, that really is bad news. Kant nodded. His eyes were shrouded with heaviness. He slowly lowered his head and took a good look before him. A Jack Allen tribe with a population of nearly 2,500, located just less than a day's worth of distance away from our oasis lookout, is indeed dangerous, no matter how you look at it. 
they seem to have a food source as well. In a tone that sounded even more serious, a desert bandit said, more bad news. Kant narrowed his eyes and peered where the desert bandit pointed. He was slightly startled. However, his expression became even grimmer. Right next to the Jack Allen tribe's messy tents was a massive number of slain beasts laid out in the sun. A rough estimation suggested that at least 300 sand gazelles were being skinned. It seemed that they had been put out in the sun for quite a while. It made them look like dried meat. Those were creatures capable of surviving in the Naran desert with little need for energy. The sand gazelles were naturally resistant to drought and capable of eating many types of plants. Since they had extremely strong life forces, it made them ideal creatures for living in the desert. The huge, mighty Sinway range, which served as the natural border that separated the Naran desert and the dukedom of Leo, was where many sand gazelles lived and bred. Kant knew at least that much. There were even hunters from the southern villages of the dukedom who hunted sand gazelles in the mountains. Now, Kant was frowning even harder. He knew that were many sand gazelles near the Sinway range, but he had no idea there were sand gazelles that deep in the desert. Worse still, the population was sizable enough to serve as prey for one whole Jack Allen tribe. My lord, there may have been one thing you overlooked. Another desert bandit, whose face looked rather terrified, had spoken. Kant frowned and asked, what is it? Desert bandits were psychologically hardened people, so it was rather surprising to Kant to see such a shocked expression on one of them. Kant's eyes soon became filled with terror, just like that desert bandits had been. Kant suddenly realized what that desert bandit had been getting at. He was unable to help but utter, this can't be. I, but it's real. That desert bandit gulped slightly and continued in a slow tone, My lord, I have no idea how this could have happened, but the reality is right before us. He paused for a bit and said, This Jack Allen tribe has no water source. There is no lake and no soil. This isn't an oasis at all, yet here they are. All of them looked stunned. The Jack Allen tribe's tents, which were a little more than 328 feet away, were extremely messy. There were Jack Allens wearing crude, ragged linen clothing everywhere, as well as young Jack Allens who had no concept of hygiene. Excrement and garbage littered the place. Regardless of how hard Kant searched the place with his eyes, there was no sign that the flat sands where they lived was an oasis. It was just like how the desert bandit said before. There was no water source. No lake. No soil. No oasis. Then again, a place without an oasis and water source in the Naran desert should have been a place of death. He was unable to understand just how that Jack Allen tribe managed to get so well developed under such conditions. It was a Jack Allen tribe with a population close to 2,500 which made it a rather massive tribe. Yet, such a tribe existed in an area of the desert without an oasis or water. It was indeed a harrowing fact. That fact struck terror in their hearts. Kant muttered to himself, something doesn't add up.